Let's open our Bibles, please, with me to the Gospel by John. Let's go to the 20th chapter. As you're turning there, I'll confess um, one of the terrible, terrible habits I have is when I read uh, a series of books, I I like to read all these um, series about the history of, of Israel's struggle for independence, and the latest round of them came out called the Zion Legacy, and there are three of them out, so I waited and bought all three of them and got the last one and opened to the end of it and read the ending to make sure my friends were still alive. Then I read all three, because I wasn't going to read it if they had gotten killed in grisly ways, and so, you know, you always like to check the ending out and uh, make sure that it's, it's going to turn out okay, and it did, and so I read all of them, but isn't that what God has done for us? He's shown us the end right, of the world, the end of what our lives are, going to, lives are going to be like when we die. He's shown us the end so that we can have great confidence and hope. And, and so there's something about looking to the end. And in this book, if you look to the 31st verse with me of chapter 20, that is the formal ending of the gospel presentation in this book. And it actually gives the structure around which the Spirit of God, breathing out through the Apostle John, wrote this book. And what he said is this. In verse 31, he says, but these are written that you might believe. So he said, these 20 chapters have been written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. The Christ in that concept, the Messiah, is the summation of all the Old Testament promises of God coming in human flesh. So that you might believe that God has really come. He is the Son of God. And that believing, you might have life. Through his name. So, so there's the whole purpose of the Gospel of John. It's one of those easy books to study because it tells us in the end what it's all about. But what's fascinating is it says that, that the purpose of the Gospel is to give us life. Now, back up to verse 30. We're going to back up through this book this morning. And truly, Jesus did many other signs. Say man. He did these, these wonder-working signs, these miracles. He did many of them. But look at this in the presence of his disciples, which aren't written in this book. So if you look at the Gospels, Jesus did 30-some odd miracles, but there are only seven recorded from verse 1 of chapter 1 through the end of chapter 20. And those seven recorded miracles are what verse 31 is talking about. But these seven recorded signs, that you can only find seven sign miracles in John's Gospel, chapters 1 through 20. Those were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that believing, notice this, you might have life in his name. Now, back up to chapter 10 with me, because as we turn to chapter 10, and I'm going to read with you just in a moment our text, Jesus is introduced as the Savior of the world who offers an overflowing, never-ending, joy-filled life to all who come to him. Now, last night, it was really a blessing uh, in our Through the Bible reading. Our children had to endure through Jeremiah 23. Now, if you want, if you have someone that has insomnia, read them Jeremiah 23. You'll knock them out. I mean, it is one of the more boring chapters of the Bible. I mean, I love all of God's Word, and we're reading the whole Bible out loud, and sometimes it's a challenge. Well, last night it was a challenge, and so the kids said, now could you tell us a story, you know, with something? Uh, That was really interesting, I think, but we didn't know what it was about. You tell us. So I said, okay, we're going to start a new round of stories. And so I started telling about my college days when I used to take a group, and we'd witness in the mill towns. If you know what the mill towns are, those are the southern towns where everybody in the town works in the mill and they pay them on Friday night and they all cash their check in the bar and they get drunk and spend most of their money and they go home and beat their families. That's mill town life. And we would go, teams of us, and we would actually, a lot of times we would stand outside the factory and try and talk to them before they went to the bars. So try to get them to go home first and not take their check into the bar and cash it and drink and all that. So I told the whole story and I told them about how how these men would get drunk and they'd buy everybody a drink and they'd spend all their money and everything and, and uh, go home inebriated. And When I got all done with that story about the gospel and, and, and how he could, the Lord could change these people's lives and take out alcohol and the effects of drunkenness, my four-year-old said, Daddy, was that true? I said, yes. He said, so you're a drunk? 
he missed one detail. It wasn't me living in the mill town. It was me ministering in the mill town. But we got that straightened out. I always wonder what he tells him in children's church, you know, about dad's drinking problem. But chapter 10, verse 7, is the message that we present to these people. And I mean, literally, we would sit in shanty houses built up on posts with, with floors with nothing but dirt underneath them. And you could see through the floorboards, and the wind would blow right through those houses. And here would be huddled little families that, with an alcoholic husband. And, and you could see all the marks of, of the rough life. And we would say, you know what? Jesus said, you can have, even in this setting, in America, in poverty and in a drunken, dysfunctional and abusive home, you can have an endless, overflowing, joy-filled life. Even there. That's the gospel. Let's read about it. Chapter 10. And you follow along as I read verses 7 down through verse 11. And think about Jesus Christ who has the authority and power to give exactly what he offers. Okay, that's what this whole book's written about. To prove he's God, prove that he has the power and the authority, and then to show the life he offers. Therefore, verse 7, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I'm the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep wouldn't listen to them. Verse 9, I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and to destroy. But I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That little line in verse 10, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it, as King James says, more abundantly. That's an overflowing, endless, joy-filled life. That's salvation. That's what God offers. That's what Jesus does in our lives when we yield to him. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, thank you on this day that we can celebrate your son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. The one who has the power and the authority and the marvelous privilege of offering to us, after giving himself as a sacrifice for our sins, he offers to us who come to him an abundant, overflowing, endless, joy-filled life. We are living that quality of life that the Apostle John at the end of his life said was abundant. It was unbelievable. And even to the end of his life, as he wrote about it, he wrote about it with a wonder and an amazement. That's what we have this morning. And I guess the question is, if that's what we have, how come we don't live like it sometimes? And if that's what we have, how come we don't share it? There are people all around us, and when we go to work tomorrow morning, they're going to come trudging in from their weekend of endlessly pursuing some form of pleasure and happiness, and they didn't find it again. And when they found it briefly, it went away. But you've come that we always can have an abundant, overflowing, endless, and joy-filled life. We say thank you. We're not worthy, but we sure are grateful for that life you've given us. Help us to live it and share it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Keep backing up to chapter one, okay? We're going to get a running start, and I'm going to introduce the second structural part of this gospel of John. The first structure that John, under the spirit of God's guidance, gives is the giving of the seven titles to prove who Christ was. Now, if you haven't marked them yet in your Bible, I'll repeat them all this morning. Number one, Jesus in chapter 1, verse 1, is the Word. He is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. That is the explanation of Jesus Christ, is the, basically God's alphabet. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the ending. He is all there is to know about God. He is the only way. Uh, we cannot communicate as humans with one another without using language and that's how we communicate truth and ideas and facts. And, and, and so Jesus is God's communication vehicle. He is the word. He's the revelation of God. Number one, we saw that. Number two, in verse four, Jesus is the light. And we talked about how you have to have light to have life. And so that's why it says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. 
He is the light that brings life to us. And we saw that a few weeks ago. Thirdly, in verse 18, Jesus is the Son. The Son. And it says in verse 18, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has revealed Him. So, again, Jesus said, I am the the explanation of God. I'm the word. I'm the, the logos. I am the, the light that God gives to give you understanding and, and entrance into his life. I am the son of God. I am the revelation of God. I'm God in human flesh. Then we saw last week, look at verse 29. The next day, uh, John, that's the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the lamb. And so that's the fourth title of Christ. He is the lamb. He is the summation of all of the sacrifices of the Old Testament. He is the completion of all the sacrifices. He is the one who was the lamb for the world. Remember, Cain uh, and Abel were to bring a lamb for themselves in the garden. Israel later was to offer a a lamb for their family in the Passover. The nation of Israel uh, on Passover offered a lamb for the whole nation, but Jesus now was the lamb for the whole world. And so he is crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem. The sacrifice was available to all out there where they could all receive him. Continuing, the next title is that Jesus is, in verse 41, the Messiah. And if you look at this, it says, he first, that's Andrew uh, from verse 40, Andrew first found his own brother, Simon, that's Peter, and said to him, we have found Ha-Mashiach, is what he said, the Messiah. And and you notice John is writing uh, not just for Jews, and so notice what he says at the end of verse 41, which is translated, the Christ, because they wouldn't know what Messiah, HaMashiach, meant. And so he says, we, Andrew said, we found the Messiah. Now, to us, we go, what's that? Well, the Messiah, that anointed one, was the whole Old Testament picture. You, You anointed kings and prophets, They were set apart once. And he said, we found not a king or a prophet. We found the promised anointed one of God, the one that is anointed with God's spirit, the one that is anointed to be the fulfillment of all of God's promises, and that was the Messiah. And so that was the next title. He is the Messiah. Number six, if you look down at verse 49, Nathaniel Uh, answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. We already met that title in verse 18, but look at this next part of verse 49. You are the King. The King. The King of Israel. The King that offers life. The King that alone can give this overflowing, endless life. So the next title is the King of Israel. Finally, we find in verse 51, the last description And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, remember, and and a little bit later when we get to chapter 2, I'm going to tell you this, we have got to realize that the the primary interpretation of any passage of Scripture has to do with what it meant to the people it was written to. It's not, well, to me it means this or that. I mean, what did it mean to them? Because it was written for a purpose. And so when Jesus was speaking to this group of men, and he said to a group of Jews, you're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending, all of them thought of the father of the Jews, in fact, the one who was named Israel himself who one day had been laying on a rock at Bethel, and in his dream, he saw the angels of God ascending and descending. You know what Jesus was saying right here in verse 51? He said, I'm the son of man. But he used the metaphor of the ladder going to heaven that old Israel or Jacob had seen in his dream at Bethel. And he says, I am the ladder from earth to heaven. You want to get to God? You've got to come through me. You want to get the pathway of life? You want to get to know God? You want to come and, and into his presence? You've got to come through me. I'm the son of man. It's the same metaphor from Daniel chapter 7 where the son of man was seen by the throne of the Ancient of Days. And Jesus said, I'm your only key of access to God because I'm God in human flesh. And the son of God became a son of man, one of us, in order that all of us sons of men, by his gracious sacrifice, might become sons of God. And Jesus said, I'm the ladder to God. So those were his titles. And there are seven of them in this chapter. And that's the way he says, 
I have the authority to give you life because I am the one that is the word. I am the light in life. I am the son of God. I am the lamb of God, sacrificed for you. I am the anointed one, all the promises of God. I'm the king, God's king, and I'm the son of man. I am the living link between heaven and earth. I am the ladder from heaven to earth, and no one can come to God without me. So that's chapter 1. That's the first portion of this gospel presentation. The second portion is what I read at the beginning this morning. When Jesus said that he offered life through his name, and that life was built around seven signposts where he reveals his deity by miracles. Now, if you've never marked these, let's start in chapter 2, and you can mark them real quick. And then I'll just briefly sketch out uh, what, what the uh, bigger picture is of them. But listen, the divine perfection of Jesus is reflected in the seven signs that the Apostle John records from Christ's life. And John built his whole gospel as a bridge with seven signposts that transport a person from where they are lost in their sin by these seven signposts showing the pictures of Jesus. And at the end of that, bridge is everlasting life. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, seven signs. The first three show how salvation comes to the sinner. The last four show what salvation does in the believer's life. I mean, nothing is, nothing is by chance. In fact, I, I was telling uh, the first service that we have to realize that this is a supernaturally engineered book, and there's not one detail, even boring chapter 23 of Jeremiah, that is not vital for the whole. It's just our lack or, or our inability to, to spend enough time to see exactly what it is God is intending to reveal. But no detail, especially in John's gospel, is there extraneously or, or just by the way. All of them are supernaturally placed. For a purpose. Now, now let me show you what I mean by that. Number one, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, is Christ's first sign. How do we know that? Well, look at verse 11. Okay, the best way to know it is read it. This beginning of signs, that's John 2, 11. This what? Beginning of what? Signs. Chapter 20, verse 30 says, he did many signs. But verse 31 of chapter 20 says, but these signs, the seven that are given, were written to make a bridge a successive signpost walkway for you to see at the end Jesus Christ. And that seeing him with the eye of faith, you might have life. What kind of life? Life more abundant. Life that overflows. You know, I just in the last hour sat up with the FOF class. I mean, you want to have a blessing, you ought to go sneak up there and listen in to those testimonies. I heard testimony after testimony after testimony of the supernatural Grace of God, the transformation, the marvelous salvation. That's a part of their class. They write out their testimony and then they share it with the class. You want to know Jesus Christ? Go across the bridge of faith that he made to show and demonstrate with those signposts who he truly was. Number one sign, verse 11. Here's the first one. What is the sign? Well, you all know the story. Jesus turned water into wine. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? We do that. You know, if I had seven years, I could do it, right? I would just go out and I'd buy some grapes and I'd plant them, the little vines, and I'd let them start growing and I'd trim them and get them to grow on the, the right way, you know, on their little trellis. And I'd keep trimming them and watering them and, and making sure nothing bothered them. And after seven years, they'd have nice full grapes. And I could take the grapes and harvest them and put them into a wine press. And I'd hold on to the strings and I'd stamp on it. And they would get crushed and they would run over into the collection pool and the dregs would settle the bottom. And then they'd run over into the next one. And then I would take them out of that last one and put them into an animal skin and let it ferment. And after seven years, I'd have some wine. But Jesus did it instantly. See, the, the lesson of the first miracle is that salvation is miraculous. When Jesus comes into your life, he instantaneously washes away your sin, gives you and me a new heart and a new spirit. He opens our eyes. He turns us from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. And our names are registered in heaven, as it says in Hebrews chapter 12. And we have a new heart and a new spirit and a new desire. And all that is not humanly achievable. It's miraculous. 
So Jesus did the miraculous in the first sign. And he showed he's the Lord of creation because he created the wine. He's the Lord of time. He did what takes a long time to do here on earth. He instantaneously did it. First lesson of the first sign is that salvation is miraculous. Look at the second sign, which is in chapter 4. You say, how do you know it's the second sign? Well, again, if we read the text, you'll see that. Chapter 4 of John's Gospel, verse 46. So 446 is the beginning of the second miraculous sign. Now, look, how do we know that? Well, look at verse 54. You ought to circle this, you know, so it just gets in your mind that, that there is no, this is not uh, by accident. This book was put together in a systematic, superintended, supernatural way by the Holy Spirit to point to Jesus Christ that we might have this super abundant overflowing life. What does verse 54 say? This, again, is the second sign. Oh, what did chapter 2, verse 11 say? This was the first sign. They're coming in order. They're not just happening, happenstance. God is engineering this bridge toward him through his son. Well, what's the second sign that Jesus did? It was the healing of the nobleman's son. And, and you know the story, this, this powerful man comes to Jesus and says, heal my servant, or, or uh, he's sick and near death. And Jesus said, okay, just go home. And, and if you notice what happens, uh, there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum, verse 46. When he heard Jesus had come, uh, he, he went down to him, verse 48. Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. And the nobleman said, sir, come down before my child dies, verse 50. And Jesus said, go your way, your son lives. Now here's the lesson of this sign. Each one of the signs has a lesson about our salvation, remember? And the man believed the word Jesus spoke to him. Isn't that a great lesson? He just believed him. Salvation in the miracle of the water into wine was miraculous. Salvation with the nobleman's son is by faith. How did this guy get his son healed? He just believed Jesus. He didn't do anything. He didn't resuscitate him. He didn't do penance. He didn't offer money. He didn't go and flail himself. He didn't wail and cry. He just believed Jesus. See, salvation is by faith. And that's the second lesson Jesus gives in the second sign. Lots more, but we can't go into that this morning. Look at the third one, how salvation comes to the sinner. First of all, it comes miraculously. Secondly, it comes by faith. Look at chapter 5, the next chapter, the first nine verses. Now, there was a feast of the Jews, uh, probably Rosh Hashanah, and Jesus went up to to Jerusalem, and there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, uh, which in Hebrew is called Bethesda, uh, having five porches. By the way, that verse has been in the Bible for had been in the Bible for 1,800 years before anybody ever saw the Pool of Bethesda. Did you know all the people, all the famous heroes of the faith you've read about, that pool was buried by Titus in 70 A.D. when he destroyed Jerusalem, and it was never seen again until the great archaeologist, Dr. Warren, in 1860, dug a shaft down and found it. Do you know why he knew it was there? Because it says in John chapter 5, it's there. Everyone says, oh, we don't know if it's there. It just says it in the Bible, but nobody's ever seen it. He sunk a shaft down by the sheep gate, and about 40 feet down into the, the rubble, he found the five-porched pool of Bethesda. It was there all the time. It's just people didn't know it. But Jesus went to this place when it was functioning, and look at verse 5. There was a certain man there who had an infirmity for 38 years, and Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, and he said to him, do you want to be made well? So Jesus is going to do another sign miracle. And and what he does, he says in verse 8, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. Did you know there were a lot of people at that pool of Bethesda? That that was the collection point. In fact, uh, the bad side of the story was the Jews had gotten a little bit into the uh, Aesculapius snake stuff uh, because of all the Greek influence. And they even had a few of those snake healers there. So this was not particularly a holy spot. It was really a kind of an outcast collection of all the misfits of society and the the people that were uh, unable to make it themselves. And they just collected them all there and they laid them around the pool and people would give them gifts now and then and keep them alive. And Jesus came to that 
basically dump of humanity. And Jesus graciously reaches down and heals one. Why does he do that? To show his grace. How does salvation come to a sinner? It's a miracle. It comes by faith. And that faith responds as the grace of God reaches that life. You see, it's a, it's a marvelous, for by grace are you saved through the agency of faith. And so Jesus, in his first three signs, shows how salvation comes to the sinner. Salvation comes miraculously by faith and through grace. So there's the third sign, and it's Jesus heals the paralytic. Now look at chapter 6. Here's the next one, and they are wonderful. And I hope that, that you have experienced in your life this kind of salvation, because this salvation is a marvelous, miraculous, faith-given, grace-offered salvation. But look at chapter 6, because this is what the Scriptures say. Because the last four signs show the result of salvation in the believer. And when you and I came to Christ by faith, chapter 6, Jesus does another sign miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. Verse 4, the Passover, the feast of the Jews was near. And verse 5, Philip says, where are we going to get, you know, he was always one of those detail guys. And where are we going to get enough food to feed these people? And Jesus said, oh, don't worry, um, There's a lad here, verse 9, who has five barley loaves and two small fish. And Jesus said, make the people sit down. He's going to do something. And Jesus took the loaves, verse 11. When he gave thanks, he distributed them. And when they were filled, verse 12. Now there is a detail. Have you ever been to one of these highbrow receptions, you know, where, you know, like a business thing? and, And they have these little tiny things that, I mean... You, you get three or four of them, you eat them, and you don't even know you ate anything, and you're always unsatisfied, and you want more. You're so hungry. You ever been to one of those? You know, that's what I think about. Most of, of what religion offers the world is little hors d'oeuvres. And people say, oh, man, that's great, but they're go-away hungry. But look what Jesus does when he feeds the 5,000, verse 12. So when they were filled. Remember, Each of these signs had a following discourse. The the bread of life is the discourse for this, which Jesus, starting in verse 22, goes all the way through the fact that he is the bread of God come down from heaven. But what is the lesson he's given to the people? When you get saved, salvation satisfies you. Look, Look what it says in verse 12. They were filled. In fact, to prove they were filled, they picked up all those basketfuls of fragments. The people had more than they needed to eat. Remember, Jesus Christ came and he says, when I come to your life, you will have life and life abundant, overflowing. What did he say in John 7? He says, you'll be like having a river of water flowing out of you, overflowing in your life. What does salvation bring? Salvation brings satisfaction. Our life is satisfied. What does the song go? All my life long I was searching and never found what I was searching for. And Jesus satisfies my soul, as the songwriter put it. Jesus, the bread of life, satisfies us. Well, look at verse 16, because here's another sign. Jesus did another miraculous sign when he stilled the storm. When Jesus perceived they were about to come and take him and make him king, in verse 15, the evening came and his disciples went down to the sea. In verse 17, they got in a boat and they went toward Capernaum. In verse 18, the sea arose because of a great wind. And when they rode three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and they were afraid. And he said, it is I, don't be afraid. And they willingly received him. And immediately the storm was over and they were on the shore. Now, isn't that a picture of what happens when we get saved? The instant we're saved, the storm of our life ceases. You see the difference? Salvation, what's the effect in our lives? It satisfies us and it brings us peace. Uh, Here's the next one in chapter 9. His sixth of seven signs is in chapter 9, John's Gospel. So Jesus turns water into wine, heals the nobleman's son, heals the paralytic, feeds the 5,000, stills the storm. Now he's going to heal the blind man in chapter 9. And uh, by the way, remember I said every one of these uh, miracles produces a, um, a sermon afterward, a lesson. Well, this blind man, and, and uh, we'll go through his story real quick. Uh, they says, hey, verse 1 and 2, who sinned, this guy or his parents? And Jesus said, none of them, but so the works of God could be revealed, verse 3. And so Jesus, verse 6, 
when he had said these things, he spat on the ground, made clay with the saliva. Now, what are those details in there for? I mean, why did it have to tell us that? Very interesting, if you study it. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay, and he said in verse 7, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. There are lots of pools around Jerusalem. Why do you have to go to that one? See, many details. By the way, he was healed and he was made to see. But look at verse 14. It was on the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees got upset in verse 15. And by the time you get to, to the end of this chapter, they had thrown this guy out. The, the one that had been healed threw him out of the synagogue said, you're not welcome anymore. So what was Jesus' sermon in chapter 10? Everybody who comes to me will never get what? Thrown out. You see how everything fit together? And through this sign, he showed them that if you come to me, your eyes will be open. Remember, salvation is opened eyes turned from darkness to light. And if you come to the light, Jesus Christ, with sight spiritually, all who come to me will never be cast out, the Lord said. And so that's his lesson. Well, here's the last one. Look at chapter 11. And by the way, it, they're so hard to go over them fast, but, but we have to get through them. Look at verse 38 of chapter 11. This is the seventh sign. Jesus turns the water into wine in chapter 2, heals an old son in chapter 4, heals a paralytic in 5, feeds a 5,000, stills the storm, heals the blind man. But now, in verse 38 to 45, he raises Lazarus. And so it says in 38... Jesus groaned, 39, take away the stone. And then he says very clearly at the end of verse 43, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And verse 44 says, he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. His face was wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said, loose him and let him go. You know what? Jesus raised him from the dead, but you know what it was a picture of? It's a picture of salvation. Salvation gives life. We who are dead in our trespasses and sin, come alive. And so what does he do? He, he teaches them that salvation in the believer brings life and light and peace and satisfaction. Those are his four last signs. And salvation comes to the sinner miraculously by faith and through God's grace. Now, turn back to chapter 2. Because I just want to show you what a blessing these are. But in chapter 2... Let me read the first 11 verses real fast and have you underline some details in your mind. Okay, let me ask you, because, by the way, I went to Sunday school my whole life, too. You know, I heard those testimonies in FOF. I heard one of them say he always went to church. So did I. I went to church before I was born, you know, uh, whole, whole life in church. And I heard all those stories. And I've heard my wonderful Sunday school teachers tell me the story of the water into wine so many times. I could retell it by the time I got out of Sunday school, Right. But what they always said is, Jesus went to this wedding, and Jesus turned the water into wine. But you shouldn't drink wine. Alcohol is bad. And then we went on to the next one. That was the only lesson I got out of it, right? Don't drink. Do you think that's the lesson of this? That's clearly in other places. It's sure not in here because they drank it. It didn't work, you know, with me. They all drank the wine Jesus made, and we're not supposed to. How come, you know? They should go to the parts where it says don't drink, which are very clear. But what is the lesson of the water into wine stuff? And also, when the Apostle John was writing this almost 70 years after it happened, he's looking back, and the Spirit of God is guiding him. And he, under the Spirit's guidance, puts in details that it seemed like he couldn't forget because they were so vivid to him. What were the details? Number one, in in verse one, it was on the third day. Third day? What's this third day stuff? Why, there's a succession, a series of events. And this is just the third day, and it started in chapter 1. It's going to continue. Second detail, it was a wedding. Why didn't you just say you went to a party? Why do you have to go to a wedding? Is there something significant about the wedding? Verse 3, they ran out of wine. That's a detail. I mean, it was important at weddings. It was an honor to provide your guests wine, which the Old Testament Jewish mind, wine is always a picture of joy and gladness. Not a picture of drunkenness and despair because they diluted their wine. And only, only those who drank it straight, they were called pagans and heathen. And so this was a sign of joy and gladness. Then look at uh, verse 6. There were set there six water pots. Not five, not seven, not four. Six water pots. 
But they aren't just water pots. They're water pots of stone. And they're for purification. That's interesting. I mean, why didn't he just say there were some pots over there? No, no, no. Six. They were water pots of stone for purification. And he even tells how much they hold. 20 or 30 gallons. Now, all these details, as we'll see next time, are vital. Look at this at verse 7. And they filled them to the brim. That's interesting. Verse 10 at the end, the, the professional MC that did all the parties, who always got to taste everybody's wine because he was the ruler of the feast and kind of was, that was his job. He said, you kept the best until now. Well, that's an important point. Verse 11, this is the beginning of signs. And look at the end of verse 11. His disciples, because of this, believed on him. Now, real quickly, and we're going to go in this in depth, let me just suggest to you what Jesus' message is of this. His sermon on this isn't recorded in this passage, but it's in the rest of the Bible. It's a wedding because Israel was married to the Lord. It says that in Isaiah 54. All that's left are six empty water pots for purification, the law, and all that had to do with the washings and the cleansings and everything else. But, but the water pots were empty and the wine had run out. You know what? The world's joys always will run out. Money doesn't buy happiness. It buys a lot of places to look for it, but you still can't find it. It's fleeting. So Jesus comes to this place where Jewish people who had the revelation of God, who were married to him, the joy had run out, the pots were empty, they were cold and lifeless and useless and empty. And Jesus comes. And he doesn't come around like at most restaurants. They give you, they say, would you like me to refill your coffee? And they put half. You know, you ever gone there and they put half a cup? I want it up to the top like Jesus would have done. You know, he filled it to the brim. And so Jesus filled those water pots to the, or had them fill them to the brim. And when he did, The ruler said, this is the best wine I've ever tasted. You know what John was saying across the 70 years? He's saying, you come to Christ, and you will have a quality of life that is as as vibrant and real and as unbelievable as the joyful feasting of a wedding, and it's the best you ever had. And God doesn't give the, the, the best to those that are young. He gives the best at the end. He saves the best to last, because the best part is heaven, where we're going And then, if you look here, at the end of verse 11, his disciples believed in him. Jesus, what he offered, they could see the the picture, they could see his power, they could see the joy he brought, they could see the hopelessness of the situation, and they were attracted and drawn to him. What's the lesson? Well, the lesson is this. You come to Jesus, you have inexhaustible joy. Your pot will never be empty, useless, worthless, and lifeless. Jesus, when he comes into your life, fills you up to the brim, overflowing. When Jesus comes to your life, as it says at the end of verse 10, it's the best there ever was. And I was listening this week to the news. Most on the radio is such inane chatter that I just like the the summary of the news for one minute and I turn the radio off. I'm not one of these people that has to have it blaring in the background. I think that it dis- dispels meditation to have just that in the background, you know, inane chatter, so I turn it off. But I turn it on for the news, but I turned it on too soon, and Roy Clark was singing from 1969. I wrote down what he said. Yesterday, when I was young, and he goes on and on talking about my drinking songs and I had so much fun. But he says, there's so many songs I won't be able to sing. I feel the bitter taste of tears on my tongue. The time has come for me to pay for yesterday when I was young. What does the world say? Live it up while you're young. Use it before you know it's gone and, and just burn your candle out. Because at the end, you're going to be empty and worthless and unable to do it. You know what Jesus says? He said, remember me when you're young and the end of your life will be the greatest and better than anything else you had when you were young. You don't need that youthful body to have the pleasures of God forevermore. That's what salvation offers. What a message of hope. And you and I have that. And that's what we're celebrating at the Lord's table that we received in Christ. And that's what we're supposed to live, and that's what we're supposed to share. Jesus Christ 
Salvation is a miracle. It comes by faith. It's through God's grace. It brings us internal, endless, joyful satisfaction. It brings us complete peace. It lights our life and opens our eyes. And we start living the way God created us to live. 